first reading this morning is from Psalm chapter 91, reading verses 1 and 2 and 9 to 16. And as I prepared to read this psalm, it came to me that the author of the psalm had great insight into God's promises to us. He knew an essential truth that this psalm teaches us. The Almighty hasn't promised us safety and security uh, from trouble, but he has promised us safety and security in trouble. Amen. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and fortress, my God in whom I trust. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And our second reading is from Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 13. The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 91, which uh, bits and pieces I've learned are probably more a reflection of the older version brings a great deal of comfort to me. It's often been a part of my personal devotions. Over the centuries, many books have been written as testimonies to the saving grace of God, testimonies to his power and grace enabling us, weak though we may be, to lead the lives that reflect his holiness. And many will lead us back to Psalm 91, and it contains some keys for godly living. When I think of John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We see Jesus the Son sent by the Father to establish relationship with you and I. This was not a religious act. This is a relationship act. God wanted to have a relationship with you and with I. It's personal with God. And so there's a connection, connecting heaven to earth or connecting the kingdom of God to us here on earth when we come to faith in Jesus. Psalm 91 has um, some clues. I just wanted to share with you three things there and a fourth thing from Romans. The condition for receiving the blessings of God. What do I have to do? Well, it's grace. So in a sense, there's nothing you can do. But in another sense, God is about relationship. If you sat with your face to the wall at home, how you would ever have got married in the first place would surprise me. But if that was your relationship, you were sat facing away from the world, tucked away in your small corner, not speaking to your marriage partner, They'd be wondering, <laughs> I'd be wondering, what is going on here? 
person who dwells in the secret place, the old version calls it the secret place. Now this is not some esoteric thing where you've got a funny handshake and a wink and a nod and all that sort of nonsense. This is a place of privacy and of intimacy. Other versions call it the dwelling. But of course I'm going to say who dwells. So if you're dwelling in the dwelling, uh, it doesn't really work out that way. But it's, it's a place that is private. It's dwelling, it's staying, it's abiding. It's not a quick visit. If your relationship with your marriage partner was like weekend access and you popped in for 10 minutes and a cup of Saturday morning and that was the entirety of your relationship with that person, again, they would wonder what's going on. It's not a relationship that's squeezed in be beside or between other things. A bit like running out to make a cuppa during a commercial break and you oh, just whip out, I'm going to pray for, well, I've got about three minutes, I think, while the commercials are on, and then back for the next over to be bowled in cricket or for uh, waiting to see with urgency uh, married at first sight and what, what's going to happen next and all the really important things in life that people get caught up in. God's not interested in your five seconds. If you're giving him the small change of life, it's about abiding. It's about continuing steadfastly in faith and in faithfulness. Faithfulness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit and it's faithfulness in a relationship. So that the primary aim is you and God. First place, priority, number one, numero uno. In the 27th Psalm, verse 4, David says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek. One thing, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. A couple of things to notice there. In David's day, there was no temple. There was no house. The ark of the Lord was in a tent, which wasn't always in the same place, even in David's day. Although they'd given it a special place, it did from time to time move. So what is he saying? He's speaking about priority. He's speaking about the priority of that relationship. One thing, all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire that there's something of worship and adoration, there's something of bringing our petitions, there's something of asking the Lord. He's speaking about a daily habit, habitual Christianity. People get addicted to all sorts of things. Smoking and alcohol and drugs and uh, different sexual lifestyles and spending money, gambling, all those sort of things. We can easily get caught up with those. But a relationship, whether it be with your marriage partner, with your children, with friends, certainly with the Lord, is something you need to invest time in regularly to catch the habit. So there's a condition for receiving the blessing. It's a dwelling. It's abiding. Secondly, it's the place where we dwell. And the King James Version calls it the secret place. So where's that? The church building. This will be the secret place. It's got a funny roof. You almost think you need a funny handshake to come in, but you don't. It's just, it's a tradition. This is a nice tradition. I like historic buildings. This is as beautiful a place as any to meet together here. But God does not dwell in houses made with hands. We carry his presence, or we should be, so is it a church building? Is it going to Canterbury on pilgrimage, as uh, Chaucer would call it? Uh, is it going to Rome, the eternal city? Or is it going to Jerusalem, the holy city? Well, I'd suggest it's none of those. You do just as well in McLean as anywhere else in the world. It's that private, intimate place of communion between a believer and God. Second Chronicles 11 speaks about uh, men and women who set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel. So we set our heart. It's a decision to make. I will seek you. 
And in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and 2, therefore, Paul says, since you have been raised with Christ, strive for the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. Now, you do need to put out the garbage. You do need to go to the shop and buy food. You do need to put petrol in your car. You do need to pay your bills and your taxes and do all those other things. It's not saying go and become a hermit and wrap yourself in a, in a, a, a hairskin shirt and go and live in a cave. What it is saying is make your aspirations higher than that. They're, they're, they're things that keep the body alive and keep you out of jail. But they're not things to take you to heaven in this life or in the next. Some of the tidiest, most organised, uh, scrupulous with their bill paying, the most amazing looking people, wouldn't be me, will not be in heaven because they've not got this priority. In fact, they've not got a revelation and their minds are set entirely on things on the earth and they're white knuckling their money down here. How old can you get? Well, some people have lived to over 120. Praise God. Um, not looking for that one myself. As you journey with the Lord, as you seek him diligently, you will find him in that place. And that place will be unique to you. You will have a place where you can turn it all off. No telly. Turn the radio off. Put those books aside. And just you and God. That can be here. I come here because it's a media-free zone. So I find a time when nobody else is here, I can come down here. That's the only reason. This isn't special. I can't get anything here that I couldn't get up there in my study. But up there I'm reminded of things. So for me it works to be somewhere else. I used to go into the garage elsewhere and simply into an empty garage and that was fine. Just simply because um, I'm easily distracted and I want to focus on God. And he understands. As you journey with the Lord, as you seek him diligently, you will find him. Isaiah 55 verse 6, seek the Lord whilst he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Somebody has said, and uh, don't want to preach down this today, but if the Holy Spirit brings something to your mind and calls you to pray to some, for somebody or some situation, good advice, drop what you're doing and go and do that. I'll do that in the commercial break. <laughs> Listen, I'll just finish whatever this is and then I'll go and do that. There are times when we need to be obedient to the still small voice. It's not so much sin, you can work that out with God. But if God is saying, listen, pray for that now, it's, it's not giving you some onerous task. It's his word to you that your word to him will bring the success in what you pray for. There's a timing in the Holy Spirit sometimes to do things. Seek the Lord whilst he may be found. I've heard people complain over the last ever since I came to Christ. Well, I don't get anything out of church. That's why I don't go. I don't like the singing. I don't like the preaching. And I don't like reading the Bible. And I don't like the way the pastor dresses. And I don't like the way the people over there... And, and you get this thing. So I don't get nothing out of it. Here's how it works. What you get in the secret place you bring to the public place. If you haven't been to the world to draw water, if you've come here with your cup empty, there is a place where if you're in a difficult place, we pray with you and God fills your cup. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But if you've been too lazy and too distracted to bother yourself and you come here and you say, oh, I never get nothing here, same as I never get at home because I never do nothing. Surprise. I was reminded of John F. Kennedy, and I'll endeavour to quote him. Do not ask what 
your country can do for you. Rather ask what you can do for your country. Can I put church in there? And there's something in that private and personal and intimate communication, which we call prayer, that leads to public Christ-centred revelation. Jesus hated a few things above all others. At the top of the list was religion. Jesus loathed religion because religion rots. It, it degenerates. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Well do you tithe, dill and cumin and rue. I haven't got any of those in my garden, so I'm stuck. <laughs> but you neglect the weightier matters. You see, they're actually important things. Their tradition, their religion said, we do this. And they were able to tell you on the checklist of life, I even get down to tithing my dill and coming and root. Wow, people would go, that's holy. That's important. I've got my robes of righteousness on. Unfortunately, you forgot about the other things, the weightier matters of the law. Jesus loathed that. But if we get into that place where we can be filled continually, God will do something for us. And when the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5, he says, don't be drunk with wine, we're in his excess. He said, but be filled. It's an ongoing, present, continuous verb. Continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's a passive side to that. You need to keep the body clean, the mind clean, so that God would want to live in there. But there are things that you actively do to invite his presence. You spend that time praying. But that's speaking to God. That can be formal times of prayer. That can be informal times of prayer. I heard someone call them arrow prayers. You've got about 20 seconds prayer up. That's fine. Listen, if, if, if you're in that intimate place and you have that ongoing relationship, every one of those prayers is, is more than useful. They're powerful. But if you've not got a relationship and the only time your kids come around is when they want money, we all know what that feels like. Okay, so if your relationship with God is like that, suddenly you need something, where is he? And, and you reach out. Oh, heavenly, no, we wouldn't go that way. Too many now, oh, almighty God, please give me what I need. There's a problem there. Jesus said, when you pray, pray, Abba, Father, as he prayed. And you can read that. I'll do that another day. When you pray, pray, Father. When we pray here, the prayers should begin with Father. There's an acknowledgement. Yes, he's the creator, although he created through Jesus Christ, the Son. So technically, Jesus is the creator. Um, He's almighty. He's all those things. He is father. And I know that there are bad examples of fatherhood around. He is the excellent example of fatherhood. He is the one that's never abandoned anybody. He is the one who's never abused anybody. He is the one who's never vented his anger on anybody. He is the one you can go to with confidence that he would never disclose your privacy in that secret place. So there's a condition that is abiding. There is a place which is that secret place of intimate communion with God. And then there is a promise. They shall abide. They shall remain constantly under the shadow of the Almighty. It's a place of shelter and protection. You dwell in that. It's not lifesaver stuff when you're out in the middle of the choppy sea with a boy around you. It's where you dwell. And that place of provision, uh, the, the, the direct benefits are listed there. From verse 14 it says, and we read there it's about love. Because he has set his love upon me. Not because I've twisted his arm. Therefore I will deliver him, says the Lord. So it's about deliverance. I will set him on high. I will exalt the person who dwells there. That we be exalted, we are lifted up, in fact, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We will know the name of the Lord. I'll set him on high because he has known my name. That's intimate. <coughs> if your relationship with God is no better than what's the name? 
We need to know that. I remember, um, but I know a lot of people who feel this way with the changing of the generations. Somebody called me Mr. Callahan many years ago. I looked around, my dad's turned up. So he was referred to as Mr. Callahan. He was um, a businessman. It was a generation where you addressed people that way. I never, ever called him Mr. Callahan. Ever. He was dead. Almighty and all knowing creator God. God is, most certainly. But because he has drawn me through that intimate place, he's father to me. <clears throat> We know the name of the Lord. We have answered prayer. He shall call upon me. I will answer him, says God. I will be with him in trouble. That's a good place to have God with you. That's God's promise. Not You've got to reach out and drag him down there. Oh, I'm busy. He's watching the cricket now. And you want him with you. He's there with you. With, I would deliver him and on. See, there's deliverance and honour. There's length of days. With long life, I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. Salvation takes us from here to the next world. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all the promises of God in Christ are yes. And in him we say amen. God, I'll have whatever it is that you want to give me. Please. And receive it gratefully in Jesus' name. In our New Testament reading, we have the description of salvation. It's the righteousness of faith. The grace of God comes to us. We believe that Christ died for our sins and rose again and that he's alive now and he's coming back again. More important than Christmas is the next coming. Are you ready for that? You can't get ready for Christmas. It happened 2,000 years ago. Salvation. And so Paul speaks about that word of faith, and it's a twofold part to the promise. Firstly, as you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That's the order Paul uses here. It's a public acknowledgement of something. You can only do that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God can say that Jesus is cursed. And also no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the same Holy Spirit. And what that means is, quite literally, when the gun's at your head, who's Lord now? Jesus is Lord. You can kill me. You can take everything that I own. But I will not deny Jesus as Lord. So when we make him Lord in every situation, it's that. There's something of a Holy Spirit there. But he goes on to say, and if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Maybe. No, no maybe in there. You shall be saved. You see, the public acknowledgement when you confess comes from the private acknowledgement in the secret place. The secret place is your heart place. So where you meet with the Lord, where you've got that revelation by the Holy Spirit of the truth of Scripture and the reality of Jesus Christ, you begin to speak it out. Proverbs says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, Jesus said, I beg your pardon. Out of what's in your heart, what the fullness of what you've set your heart on, what you've set your mind on, things above. Out of that abundance, the mouth will speak. If you are fully convinced that someone you haven't seen for years, 10 months in hospital, might be interested in, oh, maybe, and you pray, praise God for a testimony that gave glory to God. God broke into that person's life. A bit of boldness. My apologies for using it as a sermon illustration. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but that's out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you love someone, you tell them in your actions, in your words, in your whole life. So if you love the Lord, it should come out. Proverbs, keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep your heart, keep it clean, keep it pure, keep it focused on the Lord. With all diligence, 
because out of your heart will come the things that guide you and, and lead you and drive you through life and the things that will come out of your mouth. And when we do that, then we can dwell in the secret place of the Most High. When we do that, then we can be placed to access every one of God's promises and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you've left nothing to chance. But grace has, do, has done all that we require. And the gift of faith, Lord God, to take that grace on board. That indeed we can dwell in that secret place of the Most High. Father, this morning, touch every heart here, I pray. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to witness afresh to the truth and the reality and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, remind us deep within of the things you want us to say outwardly. Strengthen us, empower us to be witnesses for Jesus. That, Lord, we can draw from that well of life in the secret place and we can give out rivers of living water to proceed from our innermost beings as we go. That, Lord, your name would be glorified, that the gospel would be preached to the poor, that indeed, Lord God, we would see and understand lives are being changed because we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.